Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on moving towards outdoor EMV. Next slide. Today, we're going to um, go through uh, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm going to introduce the presenters. I'll talk a little bit about Connexus. We'll get to the main feature of the presentation, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Next slide. So a few housekeeping notes. The webinar is being recorded, and it will be made available in approximately 30 days. You can find all of our webinars on our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash Nexus online. We also link those uh, webinars on our website under resources you can click webinars and you can view past webinars and download presentation decks from previous webinars at the end of today's webinar we're going to send out a survey it's really short but if, if you answer the survey you'll get a link to download the presentation deck otherwise you need to wait about 30 days and then it'll be available on our website so all of you that are in attendance here are on mute if you have questions, you need to ask those through the webinar interface. There's a box for questions. Please feel free to, to start typing those as the presentation is being made. You don't have to wait till the very end. And we'll um, get to as many questions as we can. So those of you that typed them in earlier are liable to get answered um, first. Um, also, we have some vendors on the line today that are going to talk to you about um, outdoor EMV and their solutions in general. I will ask that you don't ask any vendor-specific questions about pricing, timelines, et cetera. And finally, if you have any questions or feedback um, or ideas for other webinars that you'd like to see, please drop us an email at info at connexus.org or webinars at connexus.org. Next slide, please. So I'm Linda Toast. I'm Director of Standards for Connexus, and I'm your host and moderator moderator today. I've also got three speakers with me um, that have a lot of experience with payments and EMV, and we're lucky to have them today to go through our presentation. First, I have Simon Few, who is the Director of Payments at Dover Fueling Systems. He has more than 32 years of global experience in our industry, and he's leading the way for EMV migration in Asia, Europe, Canada, and most recently in the U.S. We also have Willie Nelson, who's the Payment Marketing Manager for North America at Gilberto Vita Root. He's been with Gilberto for a little over three years, and he's currently focusing on payment products and EMV migration in the U.S. And last but not least, we have Dan Harrell, who is the Chief Innovation Officer in Venco. He brings over 20 years' experience in retail and petroleum companies around the world. In his current role, he's responsible for strategic and product delivery initiatives. Next slide, please. So Connexus is a nonprofit technology organization dedicated to sea, store, and retail fuels industry. We're independent of NACS, or the National Association of Convenience Stores, but we work very closely with NACS as their technology arm. A membership in NACS does not equal a membership in Connexus, and vice versa. Connexus is a volunteer organization. Our volunteers from company, our member companies, including those that are represented here today, are the, are the um, subject matter experts that do the heavy lifting. Connexus sets standards in the area of data exchange, such as EB2B or POS back office. We also do security um, standards in education, and we also do payment standards, such as mobile, EPS, or loyalty. We do a lot of education. Um, we hold these monthly webinars. Um, we do a lot of white papers. Um, you can find all of our public facing white papers under resources. And I'd like to point out that there is a paper out there under resources that is a resource for EMV in general. It's got a lot of really valuable links in it. So various topics that you're interested in EMV, you can um, download that paper and then find links of where to go to, to get more information about particular topics. Um, we also advocate for our, our industry with other organizations. Um, we try to steer towards what's good for the industry. Um, we want other standard setting bodies and other um, industry or other bodies that are setting regulations to make sure that they understand about our business realities. So we're there at the table to make sure that what they do doesn't negatively impact our industry. 
Um, and EMV is no exception. We participate in the U.S. Payments Forum as well as um, I sit on the EMV Co. Board of Advisors as a business associate. Next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned that we do monthly webinars. Typically, we take the month of October off because of the NAC show. But here's just a brief list of what we've done in the past and, and our topics for September and November. Again, if you're not getting emails regularly from us about the webinars, just drop us a line at, at webinars um, at connexus.org and we can get you signed up on those mailing lists. Or if you have a, a, an idea for a topic for a future webinar, we'd be glad to hear from you. Next slide, please. So the next show is just a little over two months away. Um, if you're attending, this is a great opportunity to visit with your vendors to get it, more information about EMV solutions and availability. It's also a great opportunity to visit with Connexus and our members. We partner with NACS to bring you the Tech Edge, which is a track for educational sessions as well as the Technology Edge Solution Center. This year we're going to be at booth 6147. Here you'll have a chance to see some of the latest technology for retail as well as have an opportunity to ask questions and get additional information about technical issues you're facing, including EMV. And then finally, I'd like to say a big thank you to our 2018 annual Diamond sponsors. Um, these companies help bring our mission and dedication to the industry a reality. So with that, next slide. Um, I'll turn this over to Simon and we'll get started on our main presentation. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning, uh, Simon. Actually, also uh, you may also recognize uh, Wayne. Uh, so Wayne is part of Dover. So, so what is EMV? So EMV is a set of international standard that allows chip card or contact card or forms of secure transaction across international payment landscape. So with EMV transaction kind of introduce a dynamic data on the card and the transaction uh, which will devalue the transaction data in flight, thus reducing the risk of counterfeit fraud. So why EMV? Uh, EMV has become a global wide standard and both US neighbor, Canada and Mexico have mandates that will impact and affect the U.S. multinational retailers. EMV is also a stepping stone to the future payment due to its uh, dynamic data authentication. Now it's chip that also uh, governs the uh, contactless mobile and uh, QR payment code. In the context of EMV, encryption is only used to protect the PIN. So it does not encrypt all the transaction data, the card data or transaction data. Next slide, please. So there are two main uh, regulatory bodies that uh, govern the, uh, the EMV for purpose of uh, allow usage across payment landscape and also the security part of the uh, transaction and equipment. First is the EMV Co. EMV Co, as I mentioned, uh, provide the specification to help to allow, um, you know, usage of uh, the media, the card, contact, contactless, as well as mobile and QR code across all devices. So the objective is to make sure that uh, there's a standard across globally. And payment card industry uh, security standard council, which is referred normally as PCI, is an ecosystem that governs the uh, security from the payment device, the application, the infrastructure, and the user. So if you look at from the, the right-hand side, you have the merchant and the processor that is subjected to the PCI DSS. That is the data security standard. Then you have the middle where you have the software, which is governing the payment application software, normally um, that is used on the ETS or your POS. And then the, on the left is mainly the pin entry devices, which is the P, P, 
PCI PTS standard. That normally uh, involves the manufacturer of all the secure device. Next slide. So with that say, uh, PCI PTS, which is mostly, mostly the equipment that is going to be used for the outdoor EMV, uh, there's a regulatory roadmap. So you will see from the beginning when they start PCI back in uh, uh, 2004, they started a PCI uh, one version and that ends and then all the way to currently the existing, the latest uh, requirement specs is uh, 5.0. So when you are looking at investing, migrating to EMV, this is one of the things that you want to consider to ensure that the equipment has the latest or if not the latest, the whatever that you are comfortable with the product, uh, with the expiration date of the device. Next slide. So now we talk about uh, the uh, EMV liability uh, shift date. As you know, there's a uh, original dates of the October 2017 has been uh, moved. And um, now it's October 1 of 2020. But I just want to give you a uh, the chart that is based on for North America, the migration that started um, back in 2015 for the indoor. And then you have um, three different columns of cart terminal and the liabilities. So the column on the carts uh, signify what type of uh, carts you have. You are having a, only a max drive or having an EMV chip cart. The terminal represent what kind of devices you have. And on the last column, the liability is what kind of liability when there's a counterfeit fraud. When it, is, it goes to the issuer, that means the issuer that issue your uh, whatever card, your credit card or your bank card. And then the acquirer, the retailer is mainly the merchant. So if there's any counterfeit fraud, who is going to eat the uh, charge back or the card brand is going to uh, have the charge back to the either the, the issuer or the merchant. So you have to bear in mind that uh, when the shift date out on from October 1st, uh, 2017, uh, there's still an exposure, what they call the exporter card. That means if someone holding a chip card from Mexico or from Canada coming to the US and if they try to use their car and if the site do not have an EMV ready terminal and not processing EMV, the chargeback can still go to the merchant. So there's another thing that you need to uh, remember is that there is no EMV liability shift on contactless or loss or stolen uh, fraud transaction. So this is mainly covering the uh, counterfeit fraud. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there is no liability shift on, on the contactless and contactless is, is a foundation for innovation and enabler for a lot of next generation payment experience, including wearable connected devices. And most of the card brands, Master, Visa, Amex, uh, they are heavily promoting as a secure, fast transaction and seamless implementation process. So that encouraged a, the migration of uh, and have a good uh, user experience using the concept. And sad to say that the uh, adoption it is uh, very, sm very small for U.S. today uh, compared to Canada or other, other countries around the world. Uh, but they are forecasting that there will be a big uptake and issuing of the card, uh, contactless card. So this is, this is the uh, um, report and the report showing that uh, by, you know, 
2021, we have about every two in five uh, cards will be contactless. And if you if you look at the uh, you contactless with the reader that can read the contactless, it will normally has the uh, NFC near field communication reader that will enable also the Apple Pay, the uh, Android Pay, Samsung Pay, and a lot of those uh, wearable devices are already Android based or or Apple based. So those will be uh, yeah, in use that can be uh, used for transacting transaction, which is be a good user experience for them to be able to use it at the uh, AFD. Next slide. I will hand over to uh, Dan Harrell to talk about uh, chargeback. Thanks, Simon. Hi everyone, this is Dan Harrell with Benco. Uh, I'll be covering the next few slides. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about effects on the timing of the liability shift uh, and some differences on how EMV impacts your decisions uh, as you decide what you're going to do in your four ports to be able to take EMV payments outside. Simon talked a little bit about the liability shift, uh, which moved from 2017 to 2020. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons why retailers should be considering what they're going to be doing in that window rather than waiting for the 2020 date. I'll cover the first of those, which has to do with the chargebacks that Visa has a part of its fraud program. And in fact, Willie will cover the second part of this, which is just the, the installation process and the logistics that it's going to take in order to replace all of the outdoor units by the 2020 time period. Um, Visa, in its implementation of its fraud program, um, has not excluded all retailers from getting chargebacks in this 2017 to 2020 window. They basically have worked with their acquiring institutions to establish um, situations where those, those four courts may fall into a high fraud domain. And basically, they've, they've broken down that program into two different types of high fraud situations. The first is called the standard program, and the second is called the excessive program. In both programs, it has to do with having more than 10K in domestic counterfeit fraud in, in any particular month at a retail location. Um, but the standard program, um, its threshold kicks in when that $10,000 is above 0.2% of domestic sales for, for that same location. And the excessive program kicks in when it's greater than 2%. Now, in the standard program, um, there's kind of a, a timeline to how it gets implemented. So uh, Visa notifies the acquirer in month one, and the acquirer is responsible for, note, for basically notifying the retailer that they have fallen into this category. In month two through four, the acquirer works with the retailer in order to try and get their fraud below the threshold level. And then within month five, if the fraud has not been reduced below those levels, then chargebacks will be enforced. So the acquirer actually has the ability to push through the chargebacks to the retailer, even though we haven't met the 2020 deadline. The excessive program is a little more extreme. So if you're in this above 2% category, basically the acquirer within month one has the immediate capability to uh, to push those chargebacks down to the retailer. And the retailer, in order to remediate that, must keep below that 2% threshold for three consecutive months. Now, the final caveat to all of this is, is Visa has basically said, if you can't keep your fraud below these levels for 12 months, you actually have the ability to lose your Visa acceptance privileges. So, the implementation of, of EMV is, is basically put there to try and address some of these fraud issues. So uh, upgrading to EMV equipment can certainly help uh, as a part of that program to get fraud below these levels. But retailers need to understand that the chargebacks are not necessarily suspended all the way until 2020. If they fall into one of these categories, they may be subjected to uh, this program. And basically the signaling factor is your acquirer uh, must let you know that you have fallen into one of these programs and that you must remediate. 
Next slide, please. Now, one of the first decisions a retailer is going to have to make when they want to upgrade their outdoor equipment to EMV is, is make a decision on whether they want to put in new fuel dispensers or retrofit the fuel dispensers that they already have. And depending upon what you're doing from a branding perspective or a refresh of the site, may guide uh, the, this decision process for you. In the case of new pumps, you're going to get a new pump and OPT warranty with the things that you place on your full court. Um, in the case that you want to basically um, continue to leverage the investment that you have in, in the hydraulics and the fuel dispensers you have on the four court, there are retrofit options for almost every dispenser out there. Now, these retrofit kits must be safety certified to a UL standard. Um, it, it actually presents a, a less expensive EMV option rather than replacing all the fuel pumps on the site. And of course, with the, the new payment terminals that you put, um, you will get new warranty on those devices as well. So depending upon what your strategy is and what you're doing outdoors, you first have to make a decision about which one of these paths you want to go down. Next slide, please. Now there's a whole lot of terms on this sheet, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a few of them up front. Um, for retailers that don't know the expression AFD, it stands for automated fuel dispenser. Essentially, it's your fuel pump, your fuel dispenser, those things that are pumping gas on your four quarts. And then I'm going to talk about this, this concept of L1 and L2 and L3, and these are designations of the certification process. Um, and I'm really talking about this as the progression of things that are happening before you're actually installing equipment onto your four quart. And it's important that you understand this process because it's been going on for years ahead of time uh, before you've had to make these decisions about putting equipment on your forecourt. But just so that you understand the terms and the process that everyone is going through, we thought we would uh, demystify some of those. So an EMV L1 certification is really about the hardware and the contact with the chip and the interactions with the contactless device. Um, it's making sure that uh, those the card and the device that the card is talking to can talk and interoperate properly and communicate information um, such that there is an interface for, for moving data back and forth. And that's really the prerequisite before you can talk about an L2 certification. The L2 certification is really how that data is, is interoperating back and forth from the card to the device uh, in order to get the data necessary in order to conduct a transaction. So you'll hear about people talking about L2 kernels um, that exist both for the contact cards as well as contactless cards. And both the, the L1 and L2 certifications are the responsibility of the device manufacturer. So in the case of uh, someone who's creating a device, uh, especially if it's contactless, uh, you need to make sure that the L2 certification exists for all the cards that you would be utilizing on your forecourt. And that makes sure that the device is, is really ready and set for taking all the forms of payment uh, that you'll be using on your four courts. The L3 certification is a little more complicated because it involves um, the point of sale or what we call the electronic payment server device. So the interaction of the electronic payment server with the terminal and talking to your host in order to do an authorization of a card is basically the L3 process. So once all of those things are put together and you have an L3 certification, then you can conduct a transaction from end to end. So that is generally um, worked on between the device manufacturer and your EPS or your point of sale provider. The final step in this is, is just to understand that most of these EMV terminals running inside of the fuel dispensers today require a TCP IP network. In the past, this would have been a serial connection via RS-485 or current loop, um, but all of the new devices are, are using uh, basically TCP IP or a regular internet network uh, in order to communicate with the in-store devices. And that leaves you with a, a couple of options that you have to decide for your location. You can either uh, run CAT5 out to those devices, and that may involve tearing up concrete and running new conduit. Um, but there are also a number of devices that can repurpose the wires that you have in your ground 
and create a high speed TCP IP network so that you can talk to these payment terminals that are now running inside of the, in the forecourt itself. So more or less, this is sort of a demystification of, all, of some of the components that are necessary for your site and the certifications that are required and that have been going on for the past couple of years in preparation for this rollout. Um, and just important for you to be able to know these terms and be able to speak to these terms when you're making a decision about PMV. Next slide. So finally, and we talked a little bit about these certifications, um, retailers need to understand that EMD is, is different from MagStripe uh, in a number of different ways. But one of those ways is all these certifications that we're talking about, they have expirations. So over time, um, your EMV level one and your EMV level two and your L3 certifications, and those things that are governed by PCI, they have expiration dates. And in some cases, this may mean that you have to update your equipment. In some cases, this means that you need to be able to download new software to those devices. Um, but just understand that from a, a technology perspective, the, the things that are governing the, the devices that we're putting into these four courts, they have expiration. So you need to think about that from your equipment decision perspective and how you're planning on doing your implementation. Because over the course of the lifetime of this product, uh, it's likely that some of these certifications are going to change. And as a result, you may need to be able to download software. You may need to upgrade a component within that device. So it's a little different from MagStripe in that perspective. But again, this is all focused on security. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Willie Nelson and have him talk about the process of doing the implementation. Thanks, Dan. And this is Willie Nelson with Gil Barco. And uh, Simon did a great job of kind of like wrapping up uh, what EMB is and, and uh, implications in terms of chargebacks. And Dan just ran through uh, the various components uh, and pieces. Um, so what I'm going to try and do here is kind of run through the roadmap and how this all kind of ties together. And once you understand what EMV is and the parts and pieces that you need, how do we kind of map this out in terms of what does this process look like in terms of uh, reaching the finish line in terms of an EMV enabled site? So kind of as we work across the top, uh, we're kind of decision-making mode, kind of where Dan was, and that's uh, looking at your AFD or your dispenser, your pump, and trying to make a decision on, you know, are we going to replace the dispenser or are we going to upgrade the dispenser to have the computing power that you need to power EMV at your pump or your dispenser. Um, the next step, kind of in that decision matrix, as Simon covered earlier, is contactless. And do we want to do contactless? Yes or no. Um, contactless can be factory installed or it can also be field retrofitted. So if you've already had a no on that answer and wanted to go back, that is an option. Um, but going over to the, the contactless reader, um, it, it offers a, a lot of speed when it comes to transactions, as Simon covered earlier. Uh, that gives you the ability to do both contactless credit cards, which are increasing as the credit card manufacturers begin to start rolling those cards out. Uh, it also allows you the ability to do Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Pay, or those uh, mobile payments that's becoming popular, especially with the younger generation, in terms of using that at the pump, uh, as well as they do indoors. Uh, feel that will be an increase when it comes to the United States, as other countries, such as Canada, it's uh, over 50% of contactless transactions, countries like Australia in the 90%. And even though the US, U.S. today is still probably around 1%, it is on the rise. Um, so that could be a great enhancement for your forecourt. Uh, it is a little faster, easier to use. Also reduces some wear and tear on some of your other devices, such as your car readers on your dispenser. Um, and then now starting to branch off to things such as watches, such as like a Apple Watch and those kind of items, where the NFC payments may actually increase to other variations outside of just a phone or a card. As we see, they're already starting to go over to uh, things such as like the um, the Bluetooth watches. Uh, so once we kind of round that horn, we know what we have or what we're going to replace. Uh, now comes the, the purchase and installation time frame. Um, and then now installing our dispenser or our our, uh, our pump at our at our site or upgrading it. Uh, an important piece here I'd like to just point out is on the installation and uh, and timelines for those things. We saw back in 2016, I think the others on the phone would agree, is that before the last uh, or the uh, back in 2016 when the EMV shift switched 
uh, to 2020, things are getting busy, lead times are getting longer, as well as uh, there's only so many technicians that are out in the field today uh, that are doing these installs and can help you get uh, to that final solution at the finish line. So keeping an eye on that will be important. Uh, as the worst case scenario would be that you do make the decision, you have your purchase, and then now you miss the date based on not being able to just schedule the right amount of folks that you need uh, in order to turn on and your pump. Um, to the next step of your site connectivity, as we went to earlier, with EMB comes more data. With more data means we've got to speed it up, and we're going to go to that IP connectivity uh, at your site in order to help speed that up. And that'll also pave way towards some other options for your site that Dan will cover here uh, shortly in terms of other options that that actually gives you outside of just EMB at your site. And as we talked about, you know, that's either using a Cat5 type scenario if you have the ability, if you're building a site, or if you want to pull Cat5, or if you want to reuse your site's existing wiring, uh, you can use a, some kind of TCP IP uh, switch in order that would convert that over to an IP uh, connection at your site using your existing site wiring. Uh, taking it to the next step, now we have to look at your indoor. Uh, so today, most are using in, EMV indoors, and that's using your point of sale system indoors. Um, when you turn on EMV outdoor, you're actually be enabling that via your point of sale. And that'll be enabling a uh, IP connection going from the indoor out to the outdoor and thus allowing you to take a EMB chip at the dispenser. Uh, that is coming. Uh, for an example, Passport today has versions of software available that you can activate EMB at the dispenser. So it's something that we're seeing sites come live today. Um, so it's no longer something that's in the future. It's something that is happening today. And as those sites grow, um, there'll be more and more EMB being taken at the forecourt. And then going to that next step, once your passport or your, I'm sorry, your point of sale is connecting to your forecourt, uh, that'll then connect in through your payment host or your acquirer, uh, those such as like a first data or such would be able to then connect it from point A to point B. And then thus uh, kind of the finish line as we're talking about of an EMV enabled site at your forecourt, being able to take chip cards at the forecourt. And some couple models I'll talk about quickly here in terms of how that all comes together. Uh, there's different stages and obviously most in the field will see that there's different stages that they just find themselves in. So the first step we'll kind of talk about a dual trip of hands-on. Um, and that's maybe assuming that you've already upgraded your dispensers or replaced your dispensers and you have those ready today. And then the last step would be to then uh, add the EMB software. And that would involve uh, having a tech come to your site, updating your point of sale to correct software, uh, as well as maybe confirming that you have EMV ready software on your dispenser or pump today or possibly updating that. And that would require a, a second trip to come on out and to uh, turn your site on. And remembering that, again, with uh, as we discussed in the last slide, um, now this will also cause a, a second pull on the resources in the field as today it's mostly installing the equipment and then going to this next step here, we'll also have those same folks out uh, activating EMV at site. So now the same people will be also not only installing, but also be used for enabling EMV at site. So then it's a little bit more uh, of a draw on our on the existing infrastructure there in terms of our techs in the field. A second option would be that say you've already, you already have the hardware installed uh, today and, and your point of sale. And then the other option would be using some kind of remote managed cloud um, software uh, in terms of a remote connectivity to your point of sale or your dispenser and actually pushing that software down to the site, um, not requiring a tech to be there in order to get that software there or maybe to have a tech on standby um, to assist um, with any of those kind of uh, potentials that could come along with uh, the software being enabled. Um, so that would be your second version. And obviously the third version there would be your big bang or actually doing everything all at the same time. Some of this will be a, a ground-up scenario where you're installing all new equipment, or potentially uh, you have uh, part of the equipment and then thereby installing hardware and software at the same time by either updating your card reader potentially or adding some of that TC IP uh, connectivity devices and then introducing the software at the same time. And then we'll run through a quick little uh, lessons learned here and just some items that have been learned in terms of when EMB comes to the forecourt, there's going to be some changes. Uh, I think we all know that and have been expecting it. I think fortunately that with the going indoors first, we've kind of tried, and then as well as in other retail spaces, 
customers are starting to learn what EMV is and what a chip card transaction is. Uh, the new challenge would be now letting them know that we now have it at the gas pump. And that'll be a little bit of a change as uh, some of the things we've noticed is in terms of the card insertion experience. So it'll be no longer a 30 year habit pattern of jumping out of your card, dipping the card, and then going on with your fueling sequence. Um, it's now having to leave the card in. Um, and that's to enable the EMV transaction at the dispenser. Uh, another piece will be also the uh, orientation of the card going inside the card reader itself. Um, the chip will have to go first. Uh, there are versions in the field that can maybe take a card read on either side, on the top left or top right. That doesn't allow the chip card to go in first. So that'll be another uh, kind of customer user experience in terms of ensuring that that chip is going in first and that they leave it. So it's kind of a double step there. Uh, moving on towards authorization speeds. Um, as some of the sites I've been to, there hasn't been a significant change in the authorization speed. Uh, there may be a little bit of a, uh, a slower transaction uh, than seen today. And there are some other versions or some updates coming, uh, things such as Visa's Quick Chip, um, which is a way in which it uh, in increases the speed of an EMV transaction. Um, and you can talk with your acquirer about getting information on how those kind of versions uh, can work. And that can be some ways that we'll see coming that maybe assist with that authorization speed. Uh, another kind of customer user experience would be combinations of loyalty and chip cards of whether you're doing uh, an EMV chip card and then having to maybe then dip a loyalty card. Um, now it's going to have two different versions in which a customer is going to have to respond uh, in interacting with the, the fuel device. Uh, contactless transactions are going to remain the same, uh, whether you're doing contactless today and then moving forward to the EMV environment. Uh, it still will be the same, so that one at least remains uh, similar. Uh, whether it's a tap and go type uh, contactless card or using an Apple Pay or Samsung Pay, those kind of uh, mobile devices. Network infrastructure in terms of the IP configuration we talked about, um, getting to know your site and having a little bit of understanding of uh, how everything is configured can be helpful when it comes to turning on EMV. Uh, knowing things such as what kind of routers you have and your uh, the big thing with the connectivity with your forecourt, um, ensuring that you have your IP connection, whether it be some kind of Cat5 or some kind of uh, TCP IP converter, to ensure that you're getting that IP connection out to the forecourt. And then lastly, kind of touching uh, almost back to the first point would be on the training. Uh, similar to when we went to EMV indoors, now there's going to be some training for our employees at these sites in terms of the managers and the cashiers, as they will be the first point of contact with customers as EMV starts to go live. And remember that as it kind of rolls out across in the US, not every site will magically have EMV today, uh, meaning that a, cu a customer may go to one site today and get gas and go to a site the next day and those may or may not have EMV. So the employees at your sites will have to uh, be aware of this and be um, kind of familiar with EMV and it'll kind of go back to when we were teaching folks how to do an EMV uh, transaction indoors. The sites I've been at the, at the forecourt, customers know what to do once they know it is a EMV environment. Um, so that's where the training of the customers uh, can come into play in terms of how do we advertise and start letting them know. Um, the built-in habit patterns will be you know, something you'll have to kind of uh, overcome initially. Um, but like I said, it's, most customers know once they know it's a chip card enabled device, they know they'll leave the card and leave it inserted. Uh, there's obviously the decals that will be on your dispenser, but some have augmented that by using other decals, by working with their brands or making sure they're staying within the brand requirements, but finding other ways such as signage um, and advertising at the gas station to alert folks that it is an EMV, EMV enabled site, it's safe and more secure. Um, we found that once they kind of get an idea that it is an EMV site, that they know how to interact with the dispenser. Um, advertising really can be great in terms of notifying your customers, and at least your repeat customers will know about that it's coming, uh, whether that's advertising at the site, integrating social media, uh, such um, media venues such as that, in terms of alerting your customers that you will be going to EMV, and that it will be a good thing for them in terms of safety, it's just that they'll have to know how to interact with your dispenser. And as a quick wrap, wrap, or wrap up, uh, it would just be, as you're looking at your site, just remember uh, having an understanding of your site, where you are on that roadmap in terms of what components you currently have today, any components you may need, and as well as knowing, uh, having those discussions with your service providers, getting an idea of what's their lead times, 
uh, how they're looking in terms of busyness, in terms of the make sure that you're staying in the loop, know how long uh, you'd have to look at in terms of scheduling and those kind of things in order to uh, make sure that you're staying up with the power curve. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Dan. Thanks, Willie. So with this decision to move to EMV, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, the manufacturers have, have also been looking at adding new capabilities to their systems that can either help you to grow your revenue streams at your sites, uh, either by driving in-store traffic, driving brand, uh, or, or doing some other things, or even saving costs uh, related to the overall expenses of your business. And I'll go over a few of these uh, in this slide. The, the first one I wanna talk to is point-to-point -point encryption. You'll often hear to this referred to as P to PE. Um, effectively, this encrypts the data from the moment it enters the card reader and can travel encrypted all the way up to the acquiring host so that basically uh, nothing in between, once the card has gotten that data into the system, nothing in any, in any of those in-between points exposes any card data. Effectively, this reduces the PCI scope for some of your store systems and can also simplify your DSS process uh, that you have to go through with your institutions. Now, there is a Conexus based standard protocol for P2PE. Um, and, and of course, we would promote that for our industry, but there are a lot of different flavors of P2PE out there. Um, so it's important that retailers work with their acquiring institutions to understand what their strategies are for P2PE and how it might reduce the expenses and the certification costs for their business. The second thing I'd like to talk to is, is media options. So uh, as retailers are moving outdoors to EMB, there are uh, larger screen, color screen options, uh, which now give you the opportunity to basically do some interesting things, whether that's educate your consumer with, with videos, uh, it could be to drive promotional materials inside of your store so that you can increase your in-store sales. Um, you can work with partners in the industry that drive ad revenue models. And that could either mean money to the retailer or reduced expenses in some other way. Or you can leverage that color screen um, to drive brand awareness rather than having stickers and decals and signs posted all over the forecourt. Um, you can basically leverage and interact with consumers in a way that they're very used to being interacted with, with video and color pictures. So this is one of those areas where you have an opportunity to to actually drive new revenue streams for your site. The second is around asset tracking and diagnostics. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that this can contribute to, you know, and what you're really trying to drive here through the remote management piece of this is the ability to reduce trip costs. So if I can solve something with a software download, that simplifies things um, from the perspective of having to send a truck out with a new piece of software to the location, um, which is an expense to the business. Now, from an asset tracking perspective um, from a, and from a technology, there's a PCI requirement for doing some level of asset tracking. And in fact, Connexus also uh, provides a standard for this piece of the equation. So from an asset tracking perspective, Connexus has a, a standard for doing this in a PCI compliant manner. But the idea here is by having this, this remote visibility into these devices, I can, man I can better manage the uptime of those devices and provide better customer experiences for people who are driving up to the four courts. And the last area I wanna to talk to is, is enhanced capabilities around dispenser security, whether this is door security or, or checking for um, um, tamper devices. Uh, by providing these systems, uh, which are monitoring the doors and making sure that no one is inside of the dispenser head that should not be, um, we have the ability to, to really look out for things where people would be inputting skimming devices. Uh, and, and this has obviously been a problem in the industry over the past couple of years. So having these new enhanced capabilities gives you the ability to have um, real visibility into what's going on inside of that dispenser head and making sure that your sites are secure and you keep out of the fraud boundaries that Visa is looking for. So some of these are the enhancements that as, as manufacturers, we've all been working on in order to provide better value to your business when you have to make this investment in EMB. And uh, I think that this is some of the good news uh, of, of the things that we've been working on. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Linda and have her manage the Q&A. Thanks, Dan. 
Um, so we've had quite a few questions come in, and if you have questions that you haven't typed in yet, I encourage you to do it now. Um, so let's start off. There's a couple questions here um, related to, I guess, the protocol for um, physical wiring. So I'm going to ask a couple of these, and, and you can respond to them individually. They're kind of combined. Um, so our, our enterprise network security standards, such as 802.1x and dynamic VLAN, considered PCI best practices for outdoor EMV. And then a related question, what about using secure wireless for the TCP IP connectivity? Anyone? So I'll, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a quick crack at that. I mean, a, a lot of this, a lot of those components of the solution are going to fall under your DSS criteria. So as retailers, you have to be aware of your network security and how that rolls up into your DSS process. Um, so there are implementations of secure wireless that are possible. Um, Wired is considered a better standard only because it's physical and wireless can be monitored, but there are wireless solutions in the industry that meet that DSS requirement. Um, so those are the types of things that a retailer would have to be aware of if they're thinking about different types of uh, networking infrastructure that they want to implement on the site. Okay, anybody else have any comments they want to add? Okay. Um, so we had a couple of questions on contactless, um, and specifically, um, one of them has to do with certification. Are there level certifications for contactless, such as L1, L2, and L3? And then is there going to be an LOA or letter of approval for contactless as separate LOA? Yeah, I can take that, yeah. Uh, so contact and contactless are similar. So you have a separate uh, contact L1, L2, and L3, and for contactless, it still apply because the contactless will have the L1, which is your contactless reader, and then the kernel for different uh, card brand uh, contact uh, contactless uh, applications. So the kernel, the only difference is that contact kernel is a one kernel that can be applied, whereas uh, at this moment the kernel for the contactless is still card brand specific. So MasterCard has one, uh, Visa has one, and, uh, and you know, Amex has one, so JCB has one. So they have their own uh, contactless kernel. And then, of course, the last step as, uh, as we've gone through is the L3, which is you still have to go through a uh, the, the certification with the with the uh, network acquirer, so they are the same, and uh, each each uh, uh, else uh, the certification will have the LOA. So some of those LOA you can actually get it uh, through the uh, official website of uh, EMV, and for for the card brand specific, um, they are also listed in uh, in. Their, their website, so you can validate whether the device has the uh, LOA certified uh, card brand. Okay, great. Um, so a couple other questions about contactless. Um, one of the questions was, what is the advantage of EMV over contactless? And I don't know that they're mutually exclusive, but somebody may want to talk to that. And then also, kind of a similar question or a related question, what's the likelihood that outdoor merchants will have terminals um, that accept both a physical dip and contactless, and then by 2020 will outdoor merchants completely skip the physical dip and only accept contactless for security reasons? I'm, I'd like to chime in a little bit uh, on yeah. just the difference. Um, specifically, the user experience of contactless is quite nice. Um, for those, and I'm sure everybody's at this point has had to use their chip cards inside of a retail store and they realize, I got to leave my card in there for a while until something happens. Uh, and then it tells me when I can pull it out. Where contactless is a pretty seamless experience where you get to kind of wave the card and once it says it's approved, you're ready to dispense fuel. Um, 
So I think retailers will have to make decisions about whether that needs to be an impart, uh, a part of what they want their user experience to be. Uh, and by doing so, they'll, they'll choose uh, options that give them contactless for the future. So to, to follow up on that, I mean, do you, do you think the question was, do you think retailers are going to like skip the physical EMV and go just to contactless or mobile, or will they be installing both? Yeah, with with the U.S. Uh, kind of cut issue based on the contactless, that at this moment, uh, yeah, I don't think there's a uh, opportunities for retailer to make that decision because if they just take contactless, it's only two percent of the car that is in circulation they can use. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. For, I mean, even looking into the future, it's all cards will be contact capable, and some of them will be contactless capable. So you would need to have that contact option. All right, great. Um, let's see here. Um, there was a couple other contactless questions. Sorry, there's a lot of questions here to go through. Um, yeah, I can't find that one right now. Um, so. Somebody asked, what are the stats on prevalence of chargeback activity related to cross-border transactions? Does anybody know, you know, what kind of chargebacks people are getting with international cards and and the like? Yeah, I can take that. I, I don't think there's any publication or Visa um, or MasterCard or anyone has really have uh, publish any numbers or figures. I guess they're only tracking on counterfeit. Yeah, and mostly the prevalent right now is more on counterfeit fraud. So at this moment, they are focusing on the high exposure area where, as uh, Dan has mentioned earlier about the program, the standard and the excessive programs, um, majority of the uh, the Touchback for cross border, cross border because there are most of them already has the chip card. So if you have a chip card, uh, then you know you are using on a terminal that is not chip, then you, your your card is not a counterfeit card. So that is just to ensure that you know if they if um, if a card holder got compromised outside of uh, uh, U.S. and they are Taking the card into into the U.S. to transact, then that's the case. But I think more prevalent is the chargeback for counterfeit uh, cards that are currently in circulation in the U.S. Okay, great. Um, here's another contactless one. Do we have any stats or a sense of how many um, new dispensers? Are being installed with contactless. I mean, are most merchants opting to include contactless or not? And I, it's okay to answer in general I, terms. Yeah, I think I think we're we're seeing it's becoming much much more and more popular uh, as we get mover. Kind of as Dan was alluding to earlier, it it is cleaner and quicker. I enjoy being able to do a. a Apple Pay transaction, I immediately get my receipt, um, and it happens nice and quick. Um, I'd say we're probably seeing about 50% um, today uh, going out, and I think that the numbers are, are growing uh, here, especially recently. I think the numbers are starting to grow as as you see more advertisements on TV for the car manufacturers talking about contactless, um, and as you know, the mobile payments, I think, become more popular. Okay. Yeah, I just want to add that majority of the card brands are heavily promoting contactless. Yeah, so Visa has a big promotion, as you know, in the uh, the last Winter uh, Olympics, they were like flashing everywhere, talking only about contactless. Right? So that that bring a lot of awareness. So I guess plus you know uh, Apple Pay is also promoting. So there's a lot of uh, things going on to. Uh, you know, from Apple Pay to Android to uh, to the card brand promoting the contactless. So 
there's a lot of merchants are seeing that. So they are seeing there's an increase in the usage. So they are taking advantage of creating this this uh, user experience uh, at their uh, site as well. So there's a say the better take up rate compared to maybe two years, three years ago. Yeah, one thing that I would add to that is other countries that have moved to EMV um, have also become very high contactless usage EMV countries. Okay. Um, there's a couple questions here about I think the 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 um, deployment models and experiences. Um, one question is. Um, does this mean for sites that have EMV dispensers installed but not enabled require another site visit if I don't have the cloud solution? And I think this potentially is a related question. Regarding the outdoor EMV cutover slide, and I assume that's the same slide, it suggests that a site visit will not be required, um, but based on what we know, um, this doesn't seem possible. Wiring would need to be converted from serial to TCP IP. Um, terminals would need to be converted. Can this be clarified? Yeah, I think in, in all those cases, there was at least one site visit required. Um, and, and what it's trying to imply is that one of those models says, you get a site visit to install the equipment, you get a second site visit for people to go in and do the software upgrade. In the second model, there's a site visit for the installation of the hardware, including the wiring and or the wiring converting boxes for the wires in the ground. And then the software is deployed through the cloud to the terminals for the upgrade to EMB. So you don't need that second site visit. In the third model, it's a single site visit, but hardware and EMB software are all installed at the same time. So there's a lot of logistical and synchronization that has to happen between that and the acquirer and everything that's going on on that day. And those were the three different deployment models that I think Willie was talking about. Okay. Um, so uh, who mandates EMV Co and PCI requirements? Is this the card brands or the acquirers? Uh, the card brands, yeah, the acquirer is part of the uh, uh, kind of what we call the issuer or the uh, uh, or, or the part of the uh, organization that the card brand is the final approval of the L3 certification. So if you, wherever you go, whether you go from one acquirer to another, example, if you say you're going to use WorldPay and then you're going to use First Data, they are First Data will have to go through uh, to ensure that the certification. Uh, is going through and the submission will have to go to individual card brand. So if you are doing, uh, for example, L3, you will have one submission to to uh, Visa, one submission to MasterCard, one submission to Amex. So, so individual card brand will have to make sure that they look through all the, the test scripts and uh, the test that is done and the result, then they can say, okay, well, you can use it, yeah. And then the network will say, okay, now you can use the EMV transaction. Okay. Um, and we've got uh, two minutes left, so we'll, we'll try to get through a couple more questions here. Um, there's a question about key injection. How how will key injection, w I'm sorry, explain how key injection will work to allow a dispenser card reader and secure pin pad to support the various bank card processors? Um, and then will all of you be handling remote key injection? So, so key injection is an important part of the process as it relates to debit pin processing and also for the future of P2PE uh, because it's very likely that there's going to be an exchange of keys uh, between the two different points uh, in order to establish that secure connection. So. Um, you know, the traditional path to doing key injection was through a kit or a key injection facility uh, in the warehouses of the manufacturers. Uh, RKI is, has been becoming more and more prevalent in, in the industry and provides a, a way to do key injection with the devices actually in the store. In fact, you can change the keys later on or you can inject new P2PE keys in the future. Um, so there's, there's different capabilities provided by uh, a remote key injection facility, a remote key injection capability um, that would allow these devices to be able to do things in the future. So uh, it is an important consideration. 
So okay. I just add on just to to make sure people understand the term uh, remote key injection. Uh, remote key injection is mostly used uh, in the industry by just describing that you do not have to have uh, injecting the key in the secure uh, facilities. So you can right. enable yes, enable the uh, the uh, key injection over and secure pack uh, you know user uh, interface that go on site or yeah if the uh, solution and enable a secure connection to a secure host where you house the key then you can remotely inject the uh, without um, someone on site so. At this moment, I think majority of the infrastructure still require a ASO or technician go on site and you know an application that is tied to some secure uh, host and then they inject it at the site yeah instead of in the secure so that give one step and then yeah in future if the infrastructure change then that give the opportunity to have a real remote key injection. And and so can each of you share whether or not you will actually support it? Yes. Um you mean today? The the uh yeah today most of, I, I believe uh we we do remote key injection so I'm Gilbarco does as well, correct. So right. so for us okay. the Nico and the NCR terminals do support our TI. Yeah. And the same with Gilbert. All right. Great. Um, guys, we're over time, and there's still a whole bunch of questions here that we didn't get to, and I apologize for those of you that we didn't get to your questions. Um, feel free to send us an email at info at connexus.org or webinars at connexus.org with specific questions, and I can um, put I, I can send these on to the guys. Um, and the the email address for everybody is is up front there on those slides as well, so you can um, email them independently if you'd like to get clarification. I know there were some questions on cost and you know specific downtime. I encourage you to talk to your vendors. That's not something that we can cover here. Um, and again, the in about an hour you'll receive a link to a survey. If you complete that survey, it's real short you'll get a link to download the um, presentation, the deck that we use. So I'd like to thank our speakers today, Simon, Dan, and Willie. Um, great information, and this could probably go on for another hour with all these questions. Um, so again, feel free to email um, info or webinars or email the, the presenters directly. Thank you, everybody, for your time, and we'll see you next month.